Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Welcome everyone. Um from every corner of the world. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are uh, situated. I am Kartike Singh. I am a senior associate at CSIS. I'm also director of programs at the SED Fund based here in The Hague in the Netherlands. And it is my pleasure to welcome all of you uh, for this conversation on um, where to go uh, after the conclusion of COP26 and specifically um, the big um, outcomes. And this particular session is going to focus on what many are heralding as one of the most significant outcomes of, of COP26, um, the big package uh, for South Africa's just energy transition. Um, this is a, a deal that was reached by several countries, several large countries, uh, major economies, um, to provide loans and grants to South Africa over a five-year period of $8.5 billion dollars uh, to help in the transition of uh, a major entity uh, in the country that is quite economically significant um, uh, to, its, to its economy, but that is really wedded um, to the fossil fuel value chain. Um, and I think this is ultimately the test case for what it looks like uh, to provide uh, financing, um, technical assistance, technology, uh, to justly move a country towards a clean energy future. And here to sort of unpack what all of this means uh, and whether or not it's feasible uh, or enough are, are two experts, friends who I have turned to to uh, invite to this conversation. I am joined today uh, by Salim Fakir, who's the executive director of the African Climate Foundation uh, and Chantal Naidu, who is founder and executive director of the Rabia Transitions Initiative. Welcome to you both. And um, you, I would like to start the conversation um, to, to get us situated um, because you know, many of our viewers know uh, some things about South Africa, uh, many don't. Um, and as somebody who, who knows somewhat uh, the role and importance of an entity like ESCOM, the major utility, um, I would love to hear from you, um, you know, briefly to understand the importance of ESCOM uh, for the Republic of South Africa's economy uh, and therefore, um, what this transition of this entity means for the nation. Um, happy to hand it over to either of you to, to take that or feed off of each other. Uh, I'm happy to go. Uh, Chantal can, uh, can add to this. Um, I think historically, uh, we have to understand that South Africa is well endowed with uh, coal resources and it shows a particular industrial pathway um, you know, in the language of economists, we've called it the minerals energy complex in which we built uh, uh, iron, steel and aluminium and other heavy industries around uh, what was then conceived as a cheap energy source, which was coal, which is very similar to what the US and other industrial economies did. They followed the similar path. Uh, uh, around that was built a massive utility, which is publicly owned. And effectively, uh, a national flag carrier for the energy infrastructure. I'm talking about generation, uh, transmission, and even distribution to a large extent, uh, largely dependent on uh, electrification from uh, one single source, which is coal. We have some levels of pump storage and a little bit of renewables, which is uh, bound to expand over the next couple of years. Uh, but we have a one single utility uh, with the load uh, center based up in the north in the coal mining areas, which uh, has one of the most extensive grid uh, capacities in the whole of Africa, even the size of West, Western Europe. So you can see the significance of the utility. And uh, this uh, um, embedded uh, sort of uh, the problem of, of actually coal dependency uh, and a single monopoly that uh, is providing electrification uh, for the rest of the country. And if anything went wrong with uh, this utility, uh, an entire cascade of uh, um, 
um, of uh, knock-on consequences can happen across the economy. So it's a systemic risk. And that systemic risk is now also a, a problem of debt. Uh, and there are lots of reasons for why the debt is the size it is. It's uh, close to 23 to $30 billion. Uh, it's a debt owned by the sovereign, even though it's on the balance sheet of the utility. Uh, so one single monopoly, high coal dependence, moving, we're moving into a world of decarbonization. Uh, anything that happens to this uh, utility has not a knock on systemic effects on the whole system. So that's what we, we have inherited from a, a coal industrial legacy. So that's what we're trying to change. Right? So uh, let me leave it at that. Maybe Chantal wants to add to it. Uh, well, thank you, Salim. What I would add is probably um, ESCOM is a kingpin in South Africa's energy transition, and that we can't speak to uh, any form of energy transition without carving out and having a critical role for ESCOM in that journey, whether it be large scale, medium, small scale, on grid, off grid, whichever way you look at it. Um, I think given South Africa's apartheid history, you know, ESC, the country created infrastructures that were needing to be independent, um, you know, at the time so we could be sustainable as a organization. Uh, it, the organiza I mean, organization of the, our economy is what mm -hmm. I mean. And so it was fit for purpose at a certain point in time. I think there's a long history of conversation after our democratic elections in 94 that, you know, there was always been talk about an ESCOM, what does it need to look like to be fit for purpose for the democracy? And we've had various models along the way. Where we find ourselves now is a little bit between uh, what should have always been done historically that a lot of people have been, you know, arguing for, fighting for, suggesting, and a sense of absolutely have to do. So a degree of crisis moment where there is a, a clear turning point. And in addition to many other factors, institutional factors, some of which Salim has mentioned, uh, ESCOM's role in contributing to reducing emissions is ever more critical, but ever more challenging because of those inst institutional legacies. Wow, thank you both for that. I mean, first of all, important to understand the economic importance of this entity and you know the fact that it's mired in debt and dealing with various challenges, but also the historical context, which I hadn't even thought of, that it was sort of fit for purpose of a South Africa of a previous time and now fit for purpose for what this institution looks like for you know, a democratic country. Um, both of those are very important. Um, I wanna ask about, um, the, the concept of just transition and, and how, what it has taken to be institutionalized, both in the country as well as an entity like ESCOM and, and what that journey looked like. I mean, how difficult was it to get various stakeholders to understand this concept in the first place? And I know there's some very, very important institutions that have been hard at work on this topic in the country for some time. Um, and and you, know, you have to do that both at the government level, but then also at this, institutional level for this entity that frank, frankly fundamentally must change. What did that look like and, um, and how difficult was it? Uh, first, let me uh, also uh, add one uh, uh, point that I think um, was brought up by Chantal. Uh, ESCOM is one of the highest uh, carbon emitters on the, on the continent. It's probably 12th uh, largest emitter globally. So it's quite significant from an ev emissions profile. In fact, per, per capita emissions of South Africa is very high, to, uh, if not close to the US or, or Europe for that matter. Uh, and the second entity, of course, that we shouldn't forget is a, a former state enterprise, which is called Sasol Liquid Fuels. These two entities alone contribute the largest share of uh, carbon emissions um, on the continent and also in South Africa. If you resolve the emissions profile of these uh, two emitters, you can actually solve uh, largely a big decarbonization problem. Uh, the just transition concept, uh, Katakia, uh, has, is, I think South Africa is one of the first countries to embed it in its nationally determined contributions. It picked up on the Paris uh, Agreement in uh, 2015. Uh, there was a, a National Planning Commission process around the just transition in which the National Planning Commission is a sort of uh, government think tank that is supposed to guide planning in the, in the future. It is a multi-stakeholder 
uh, institutional mechanism embedded within the presidency. Uh, but uh, there, has, there was a hiatus um, and the concept has been largely revived uh, in an in a investment conference that was held, I think in 2018 by uh, the incoming president, Cyril Ramaphosa, which uh, uh, the delegates at that conference, particularly the labor union, remember the just transition concept is not new. It actually comes from the labor movement in the US actually, uh, due to environmental policies in the 1970s and the concern of the labor movement in the US that many jobs are going to be lost. And so uh, the labor union uh, the, at that time already tried to bring this into the picture. It was then subsequently picked up by the ILO. Those same unions are uh, also uh, members of the ILO, uh, and particularly the International Trade Union uh, uh, you know, Council, it took, uh, and a lot of the labor, labor, labor unions thinking on just transition because many of the members are in the coal mining sector, I think looking at 90,000 members. But this issue now is becoming a lot more pertinent uh, because of the link between energy transitions, decarbonization, and the displacement of potential jobs and livelihoods in, in the coal mining area. And we do have a thing called the Presidential Commission on Climate Change, which is actually set up specifically uh, to mediate this conversation between multi-party groups. And it's actually looking at not only a framework for how to bring that lens of just transition into the debates on decarbonization and the pathways in different sectors, but also to come up with concrete proposals of what are the fiscal policies and other instruments we can use to support uh, the just transition in South Africa, which is really about uh, justice to those people who will be the most harmed by a fast pace and fast track transition. Uh, so that's where the debate is at the moment. I don't know, Chantal, if you want to add. Yeah, I mean, what's fascinating for me, Katake, is that you speak about it as though we've already achieved this, uh, you know, common narrative of a just transition. And perhaps on that particular point, I would say it's work in progress and it's contested and it's noisy and it's chaotic mm -hmm. and it depends on who you ask. So there are neat and very important institutional mechanisms that are trying to lead on uh, a narrative for the country around what a just transition looks like. Um, and those are the structures Salim has mentioned. ESCOM itself has got a just energy transition office uh, where they have been, and that's quite an important institutional innovation that's actually happened in the last two years. Because you asked about what did it take to get to this point? I think it took a lot of under, you know, things that are not visible, like an earthworm in, in some sense, a lot of undercover work for a long time before things became visible. So ESCOM's Just Energy Transition Office was easily two to three years in the making of an internal process within ESCOM to manifest that, you know, institutional structure that then can lead and be a counterpart for the likes of um, other counterparties. And then in the last two weeks, we've also learned that the, the Department of Minerals and Resource and Energy also are looking at creating a just energy transition office One, from their two. perspective. So we're seeing now in 2021, a manifestation of the, the, of the really the sweat and tears of a combination of civil society, technocrats, policymakers, activists from inside and outside of the country lead up to this moment. But just to be clear, we don't have a common narrative across all stakeholders of what a just transition actually is. And we do have tension between those who are more tuned to a technological view of the just transition relative to those that see it as more of a social dimension. And we're seeing debates unfold even in the intellectual academic policy space of, of sort of you know, the financing of it and what does it look like and who is it supposed to benefit? And there's both benefit in that, but there's also a sense of splitting hairs without really trying to start focusing on impacts and short-term immediacy of implementation. So it's still very much a contested space, even though as Salim rightfully pointed up front, we are actually one of the, as far as I know, the only country from our first NDC that put in the just transition as a prerequisite for achieving for our response to the Paris Agreement. So regardless of that, 
history, it doesn't mean we got it right, but it means that we are certainly involved in a very dynamic and active conversation in SA around it. Yeah, no, it's interesting because, and thanks for sort of clarifying that it's a work in progress and it's noisy, right? And it's still being worked out, uh, but it sounds like it's found entry points at various, in various different ways, uh, you know, everything from uh, having it in the Paris Agreement uh, Declaration to um, to the different departments kind of working at it internally, to the labor unions, the inside, the outside, um, all sort of um, trying to influence and kind of coalescing around the fact that there needs to be a just transition. We don't know exactly what that means and for and what that looks like still to be worked out, but everybody is watching, obviously, right? This is the, the example that people will be looking at. I have several questions and I realize that we probably don't have enough time to ask all of them. So I'm trying to think through what's the next uh, most relevant question. I think where the conversation does go from here naturally is, um, you know, people after COP26, people were left kind of wondering, you know, if this is the test case uh, for delivering financial assistance, technical aid, uh, technology transfer, et cetera, to a country to actually transition, what do other countries need to, uh, to get a South Africa-like package? Could there have been more bolder declarations by certain other countries if, if, if other you know, donor governments had coalesced around a strategy for someone else? Um, and what might other countries learn that are in a similar position to South Africa? Chantal, do you want to take a stab at this first? Mm, thanks, Kathikea. Um, so I'm going to, I've heard it described as the BBC view, where you say it's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Um, so my views in some ways are, I think for, it's too premature to say that this is a example yet for other developing countries to follow. And why I say that there's a degree of you know, that being premature is that there's a lot of details that still have to be worked out around that package, right? There was a journey that, that was both a technical, a political, um, as well as, you know, deep number crunching journey of at least two, three years by a number of, you know, um, uh, not lots of intellectual work behind it. Yeah. Um, so, but where are we at now is that a lot of the that, that term sheet, the details still have to be worked out, especially around, you know, as a developing country, are we still adding debt on top of debt? What portion will be grant? What portion will be, you know, uh, uh, debt component? Um, what constitutes fairness and justice in the context of providing financial packages for just transitions on that level? So, and, and things like, you know, the rate, um, the performance criteria that stands about it, the dependency on the policy environment, what handcuffs might be put on South Africa. So for all of the lack of detail, I think that in as much as it sounds wonderful that this could be a test case, I think it's premature to label it as such. And I think it's important that other countries more than anything think about if they were to take on this and they had to start negotiating, they should think about what are the points of reference we need to be putting to our counterparts and donors that we would require. Because it's important that it is a country-led process and a country journey. We should be defining part of those terms and conditions you know, um, as developing countries. Because some countries have no option but to develop, as Celine mentioned earlier, you know, we are a country that's richly endowed with coal and many mm -hmm. African countries might have similar resources and then say, step back and say, well, why should we take such a hit? We need to still develop. So that trade off, right? And yeah. I know there were some heated discussions at COP around that. And maybe on the other side, you know, just to give a balanced view on that, I think that there's potential for this to be um, a very important, you know, signal, but it, I think we still need help to make that happen. So it was really valuable that developed countries came together and appreciated that in order to make the Paris Agreement real, right, you needed to account for the fact that countries like South Africa, heavily dependent on a path that's been set in motion for the last 60 years plus, right, needed a needed to have you know finance carved out to help its transition journey, and in our case, it is centered around a particular institution. Yeah. But it is also just one part of a much bigger frame of finance. I know that's one of your interests as well. Is it enough? I don't believe it is enough because transition is a journey and a process. So the 8.5 billion is one part of a domino that helps start the journey. 
but it doesn't end there. And we still have to work out where the tributaries of finance are necessary. Yeah, Salim, your thoughts? I mean, yeah, I, I just um, want to pick up. Uh, uh, first, we, we have to credit the fact that the Just Energy Transition Unit in Eskom actually did a lot of the hard work because it's not just a technical process. There's a lot of socialization. Remember, Eskom is a mega, mega company, 40,000 workers. You have to bring a lot of people on board. And beyond Eskom, they had to get the buy-in from their political principles, which is the Department of Public Enterprise and the Ministry of Environment. So lots of political work also had to be, uh, be, be uh, engaged uh, in order for the technical and the political side to be aligned. Uh, I just want to clarify that uh, you know the, the this is not a deal yet. It's a it's a pledge to commit to working towards a deal. It has uh, 8.5 billion is not the total quantum that's required by Eskom. In fact, it's about 23 billion dollars. Uh, the terms of the deal would largely depend on the extent to which uh, Eskom's uh, debt service costs can be brought down significantly by a deal like this. But this is not going to go onto the ESCOM balance sheet. There have been ideas like that uh, floating around, sort of like a carbon debt swap kind of model. But this is a, a pure, uh, what I would say, a very ring fence, uh, special project, uh, special purpose vehicle to finance uh, infrastructure, which will in the long run benefit ESCOM because it sort of takes it off its balance sheet. What's, which will be linked to performance. It really depends on the concessionary terms. And, uh, and I think this is a very fundamental debate. No country in the world that is stuck with coal that has been asked to do this on a fast pace is going to put at its own economy at risk and its so uh, sovereign right. economic situation at risk. This includes Indonesia, Indone Indonesia, unless there's a real good deal. Uh, Germany was brought back to its feet after the Second World War not through loans, but through grants. The Marshall Plan was a grant. It wasn't uh, a loan that served the economic interests of the US because it was able to take its surplus uh, engineering and other capacity onto the European continent. Uh, so the, the, the nature of the deal has to be also beneficial to the counterparty. That they're not being seen to be pushed off a cliff because somebody else feels that um, South Africa must be made an iconic example uh, that other countries have to follow. So I, I am uh, fairly excited about it uh, because I think it, uh, even though there's a long journey to walk, symbolically it's brilliant. It symbolically tells a story of how similar kinds of deals can be made elsewhere, but they have to be aligned to the economic interests of those countries. They cannot undermine them and they cannot assert more debt on those countries than they can uh, absorb. And it lead, needs to lead uh, to a transition that leads to the right kind of growth and the kind of inclusive economy that can be built around it. If none of those criteria are met, I don't think it's uh, useful for a country to take on climate finance that is going to penalize it. Uh, there are also strategic imperatives where South Africa has to do that. But remember, we built a whole renewables program without taking one bit of climate finance from anybody in the world. So that's just an example of the contrast that we, right. we can do. So the JET needs to understand the, the JET uh, transition transaction process has to be aligned to a lots of other different interests. And it cannot be a form of uh, uh, injection of climate finance that takes a country off a cliff. It has to be uh, done in a manner that's sensitive to different interests uh, in the country. Well, we have, thanks, Salim. Um, we have about six minutes. Um, again, not enough time, but we've talked, I mean, this is a journey. Uh, and as you rightly pointed out, you know, renewable energy has started to take off in South Africa without touching climate finance. This may not be enough money. It's part of a domino uh, effect to get that journey started, as Chantal said. Where does South Africa go from here in its industrial strategy? And, and that's not enough time for both of you to talk at length about what its future strategies could be like. But if you could just take you know, two minutes max each, and then I'll try and summarize. Uh, and then this is a conversation that clearly needs to be continued to have. Um, so uh, uh, I'll go very quickly, because I think uh, the other part of the agreement that has been missed 
that this is not just an ESCOM piece. There's also a big component around uh, hydrogen and electric vehicles. So there's a broader package. And that talks to the sort of debate around industrial industrialization, mm -hmm. the linking of the just energy transition transaction to uh, en enhancing other industrial capability uh, because hydrogen fits well with uh, already an industrialized economy, particularly in the petrochemical sector, uh, where we can switch from gas to hydrogen. And we have a very strong automobile, uh, automotive industry. So this uh, shift to electric vehicles uh, with utilization of uh, beneficiation of new minerals like lithium, platinum, etc., cetera, uh, would uh, go a long way to building an industrial, uh, strengthening the, uh, South Africa's industrial capability. So the jet must also be seen as part of uh, that alignment. And uh, often the, the, the other two components are less talked about. Uh, most people focus on the renewable side, but there's a broader picture uh, that is also coming into play. And it's partly to address the fact that uh, we have to grow our manufacturing sector because it's on a, on a sort of decline. And well, one way to boost that is to look at these new energy carriers, the new en uh, energy technology, uh, sectors to uh, increase uh, foreign direct investment, but also mobilize more domestic resources behind a new uh, industrial capability. Yeah. Chantal? Um, I think, I mean, adding to what Salim said, I won't repeat those, but I think maybe just speak to the other end of the spectrum. What I think is shifting is more spatially, the industrial agenda at its more spatial level. So what the this this um, signal, I would call it a signal from the COP has done, is that it starts sensitizing a number of other key government departments, you know, around their contribution. And in that way, it's very powerful because it puts everybody on guard and like, what does this mean in terms of if ESCOM decarbonizes and accelerates its journey in the next five to 10 years, what does that mean for you know, other industries? So it's, it's really sharp in the mind in terms of real practical implementation. So aside from the EV and that green hydrogen, what I've observed is that on the mining sector, the issues around regenerative, you know, um, regenerating in certain spatial regions mm -hmm. and how does that flow in terms of entrepreneurship, small to medium enterprise businesses, the opportunities mm -hmm. that you create at scale and on scale and accelerate that as well because the other thing we can't forget is that South Africa is the most unequal country in the world we don't need a decarbonization agenda that perpetuates and widens that gap so that is an acute issue for us as a nation yeah again bringing it home to the fact that South Africa is so unique because of its history um, and that as this conversation and put into practice that it must not exacerbate um, some of those divisions that have, have been a part of that society for so long. Um, I think, you know, the institutional innovation side of this on the government are, could be seismic, as you're rightly pointing out. I mean, the ripple effects for every uh, department to sort of view their world in, in one in which there is a decarbonization strategy um, offers plenty of challenges, but also many opportunities, um, you know, in, of growth, of, of job creation. Um, again, like as, as, as I said, when we were starting this out, this is not enough time to have this conversation with two incredible experts um, on this topic, on, uh, on South Africa in particular, um, uh, but I thank you for your time today. I mean, I think we are, there's a lot of pressure uh, on South Africa. There's rightly a lot of excitement that goes with that, um, but I take note that, um, you know, this is very much a conversation um, that is getting uh, activated now, um, and the money still needs to show up. So I think we'll be, we'll all be watching, and hopefully that pressure uh, will not be so much that it dampens the excitement and enthusiasm that so many people are feeling, um, but that only propels um, it to sort of really deliver on what might be the most equitable outcome for South Africa and the many people uh, that will depend on this transition going smoothly. Um, that's a lot to ask, um, <laughs> and that's of course uh, work for you guys, um, uh, you know, as as experts and practitioners in the space. But thank you again um, for your time today um, uh, to to speak about this. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Kia. It's been brilliant. Yeah. Thanks.